All right, can people hear me fine and see my screen? Yes, welcome CK. Okay, so uh, yeah, I do have a couple movies, so hopefully that will, that will work. Uh, so first, uh, I'm CK Chang. I'm an assistant astronomer at the University of Arizona, and I'm a member of the Event Horizon Telescope uh, collaboration. So I'm very glad that uh, you know, the previous talk also talked about uh, you know, gravity, especially on gravitational wave. So I guess that saved me a lot of introduction. Uh, but you know, the EHT is a smaller collaboration compared to, to LIGO. So I guess you know, we have a smaller team on uh, your developing pipeline. Uh, Michal Janssen lives on the slides. Uh, I believe he's also here. And uh, he's uh, actually the one who, who is running the, the pipeline these days. So uh, I would say you know, if, if there are uh, questions, then maybe Michal can just speak up and, and answer some of the, the technical stuff. And uh, I would just you know, try to give people a uh, you know, introduction to the science that we are doing uh, and also how we are using uh, Pegasus. Our workflow is actually very simple. So uh, you know, I, I don't put too much effort in explaining the, the pipeline itself, but I think uh, what Pegasus enables us to do is very important. So uh, thank you very much for de developing the tool. <clears throat> okay, so uh, for the EHT, our goal uh, is pretty much trying to uh, answer you know, if Einstein is right in the strong field gravity regime. So the uh, left image here, the orange donut that you may have seen, that this is the, the first uh, horizon scale image of black hole. We actually observed black hole for you know, for a very long time now, but uh, until you know, this few years ago, we actually would not be able to, to resolve the event horizon scale. So this is the first image that that's able to do that. So uh, again, for the introduction, let me just try to explain a little bit what people are seeing in that uh, orange donut. <clears throat> so the idea here is on the left, uh, this is actually a, a picture from a very old uh, textbook that you know, if we have a star that burn off is your, uh, your fluid, then it collapses uh, in, into a singularity. And then the, uh, the, you know, the, the density is so high that it curves the space time so much that even light cannot escape. I guess that's the, the standard way to say that. But what this figure is showing is all of these you know, uh, you know, funnel-like stuff, they are actually the, the light cone of different events in this space time. So the, the cone on the up, that is your future light cone. And because the, the space time got curved by this very you know, dense uh, central singularity, the space time actually got stretched so much that the light cone is now tilting toward the central singularity. So I actually told my uh, your long scientist friends that uh, in some sense, the space time so curves so much that your future now have to point to the, the, central, the center of the black hole. So uh, you know, I guess that's a romantic way to, to say that you know, the, this, uh, this object is changing uh, people's future. Now, if you do a you know, thought experiment, you have a, you know, this black hole and you shine a flashlight to it. Now, because you know, there is a, you know, this future light cone is moving toward the black hole. So there is a boundary that the, the light will uh, you know, enter the event horizon without coming back. But if you are just slightly outside this boundary, you know, even light can actually orbit around this very dense object. So some of those light will go around this black hole and shine back to you. So uh, but in this, uh, this calculation you know, many centuries ago that if you do this experiment, then we expect to see a light ring. This is not exactly what we are seeing in the uh, your black hole image because in that situation, we have you know, a lot of plasma falling onto the black hole and it's the surrounding giving us the light, but then the principle is very similar. Now, if we take this uh, physical picture that we shine a flash line and then things, you know, the light all around and come back to form as a ring, uh, depending on the theory of gravity, the shape of this shadow can actually change. And we can actually do calculation on this. So there was a paper by uh, Tim Johnson and, and Dimitri Sautis you know, uh, you know, 10 years ago, describing if you change your gravity theory, change the space time, then the, you know, this photon ring that we are seeing, you will have a different shape. And also Via Medeiros recently has a paper on how to you know, parameterize this. So because of this, 
a being able to image this black hole, this ring around the black hole will give us the tool to uh, test general relativity in the very strong uh, you know, gravity regime. Okay, <clears throat> so I also mentioned earlier that in reality, things are a little bit more complicated because they are plasma falling into the black hole. So this is a visualization of how we are trying to model the, the actual situation. So uh, on, on this box here, there is a black hole at the center and we are using HPC simulation to follow the plasma around the black hole. And you know, this uh, volume rendering here is actually the magnetic field generated by those plasma. So we have this very bright funnel, we have the accretion flow falling around. And when we want to simulate an image, what we do is we create a virtual camera. We trace each pixel of that image playing back to the black hole. And you know, if we are far away from the black hole, then the light ray is not going to bang and we just see the direct image. But for a pixel that's very close to the, the black hole, it will orbit around the black hole and create some funny features. Now, so when we do this kind of simulation for many, many uh, you know, snapshot of you know, through a simulation, we get a movie uh, like this. This is what we believe uh, what's going on around the black hole. You will see this uh, ring here that I talk about, but you also see a lot of extra uh, you know, bright feature around that. Those are the emitting plasma around the black hole. And then the whole goal of the EHT is trying to make image or even movie of you know, astrophysics uh, configurations like this. Okay, so uh, this is another movie that explain uh, why when we are doing setting up this experiment, we choose a particular wavelength. So at the beginning of the movie, uh, we are actually observing the black hole in some very long uh, radio wave length. I believe this, this is a centimeter. At this wavelength, the plasma itself is optically flake. So you cannot see through the plasma, you only see this blob. And because of this, you won't be able to see the black hole itself and we cannot test gravity, we cannot test general relativity. But now as the, I play the movie, uh, we are now observing this black hole in shorter and shorter wavelength. And toward the, the end of the movie, uh, we are now looking at this black hole at 1.3 millimeter wavelength. So this is the exact wavelength that the Event Horizon Telescope is doing our observation. The accretion flow becomes transparent and we can see directly at the, the black hole. So again, you know, this allows us to uh, you know, test general relativity. Okay, so this is the team. Uh, we got about uh, you know, 200 people uh, a few years back. The collaboration is growing. We have about uh, 300 members now. Again, still it's much smaller than uh, LIGO. Uh, and you know, our collaboration used uh, different radio telescope all around the world. And, and uh, we connect them computationally to form a uh, your virtual telescope to resolve the event horizon of the black hole. Okay, so um, the idea how this work is we have this radio wave sending, uh, coming to us from the black hole and then we use multiple uh, telescope to actually record the, the radio waveform of, of this, uh, the, the waveform of this radio wave. Okay, and uh, yo, the farther the, the uh, telescope, uh, they form a longer baseline and that actually help us to resolve better than the, the small scale features in the image. So, uh, and in order to uh, use post-process, use computation method to combine this signal, we also need to have very accurate atomic clock at this telescope to give us the timestamp of this data. So the way you think about that is you, know, you have this image on the sky, they have different bright spot and each of them is sending out your radio signal. But because the, of the angle is slightly different. So this wave from when they hit the telescope, they are slightly offset. So by taking into account this slight offset in this radio waveform, we are able to reconstruct the, the image. So uh, the 2017 was our big year. That's the time we really run the full array and then did, the, did our observation. And uh, this is our data set. So we, we were using uh, a telescope back when, and then you know, this is 
our data set covering the four-way domain of the, the image, uh, the, the four-way domain. So the idea is you know, if we are able to cover every data point in this domain, then we actually don't need to do image and we can just apply a inverse four-way transform to get the image. But because we only have that many telescopes, uh, there are a lot of holes in this, uh, you know, in, in this four-way domain. So we need to come up with clever imaging algorithm to reconstruct the, the image. Now, in terms of data pathway, when we uh, get the data set, uh, because we actually need to record the radio waveform, so uh, the data volume is about petabyte. We actually need to store this uh, petabyte of data to hard disk, ship them to our data center to do a step called correlation. So the correlation is going to remove the noise and actually turn the telescope data into the four-way domain. And then we do calibration to remove uh, you know, all the systematic error, and at the end, we do an image reconstruction. Now, this is relevant because when we use Pegasus, we actually need to uh, reproduce a lot of steps in, in this data analysis pipeline. We do not actually do the correlation step, but we actually do calibration and imaging in, in our Pegasus pipeline. Now for the actual data, uh, the, the raw signal is petabyte. After we do the correlation, it's terabyte. And then we, you know, after the calibration, we turn it down to megabyte and then the image is kilobyte. So this is a very, very big step in image uh, reduction, in, in data reduction. For the Pegasus pipeline, we actually start in the place after correlation, depending on our setup, we can generate your data at gigabyte scale. And then we ask you know, the, the, our pipeline to, to uh, you know, do the, the calibration and imaging. All right, so if we do not do the calibration, this is how the data will look like. Uh, the details is not important. I guess you know, all I want to point out is the red curve here. This is the face of the data and you can see they are just scattered everywhere. And after we do the calibration, they, they line up together and then we can now average them together to, to reduce the loss. Now, a lot of this uh, you know, effect come from the atmosphere turbulence. So there was water vapor, a lot of stuff happening in the atmosphere and that mess up the, the phase information. So this is a very important step in the cal calibration. Um, okay, so after we, we go through this calibration step, this is the uncalibrated data. After we calibrate that, then the data become much cleaner and then we can start fitting our model and then you know starting to to reconstruct image to that so this is a visualization of how this process really work so we have this telescope all around the world that we join them together as the earth spin they start to fill up this four-way domain and with the calibration then you know we come up with these data points and then we start to reconstruct the, the black hole image all right, and we have multiple methods to compare the uh, image with observation. For example, we can actually go into the image domain, trying to figure out the size of the black hole and then use that to, to test general relativity. Or we can uh, come up with very simple geometric model and try to fit the data. And another way is we have large uh, simulation library, the, the black hole image simulation that I talked about at the very beginning we actually try to fit those to the data. Okay, so all of these you know, different steps, they're actually computationally quite expensive, although they are embarrassingly parallelizable. So uh, that's the place that we find Pegasus to be very useful because we have this large simulation library. We want to you know, take each of this model and then compare that with our observation. So the, you know, this is actually pretty new in the sense that the, the paper that we already published didn't use this method. Right now, one of the things we want to do is to do this full forward modeling. We use HPC to simulate the plasma around the black hole. We do the ray tracing calculation to simulate the image. And then we send through this image to a synthetic data uh, pipeline. So this pipeline you actually uh, do virtual observation of the image. We even put in all the systematic effect that we can model, including the atmosphere effect that I mentioned earlier, including the randomization of the phase and all of those, those effects. So 
in this pipeline, we, you know, because we fold in those effects, we recalibrate this synthetic data. So this is the, the very computationally expensive part that I, I just mentioned. And once we do this synthetic data, we have the forward model from this you know, theory, and then we can compare this thing with the, the observation to tell us you know, if Einstein is right or not. Okay, so, so this is the thing we, we are used Pegasus for. The pipeline itself is very simple. After we gen, you know, do the HPC simulation and generate uh, the image, we pull off our image in the side world data store. And then we ask Pegasus to pull, the data, pull this image from SciWorks. And then we model the interstellar scattering, which I didn't uh, mention about. We do synthetic interferometry uh, data. So we do mock observation. And then we all model all these observations systematic. And then we recalibrate and even re-imaging this synthetic data. Okay, and at the end, we push this synthetic data back to SciWorks for other people to, to work on. So this very simple workflow is all done in Pegasus. And, you know, and this is very useful because uh, you know, the, the whole workflow is now fault tolerant and self healing in the sense that you know, when we have some job that fell or, or some data that you know, we, we are not able to push to, to SideWorks yet, when the workflow try to pull that data, if it fails, you will try to redo that. So, because of Pegasus, now we have a fully automated workflow for, for this. Some of the technology we use include uh, Docker. So we actually dockerize the whole uh, you know, synthetic data pipeline in Docker. And then we use the, you know, this uh, CVMFS singularity uh, uh, you know, synchronization mechanism to push our Docker image to the open science grid for, for us to use. Uh, we also use the web dev interface of the cyber data store. Uh, as of today, you know, the last time I looked up, I guess we already sent in half million jobs and we burned uh, you know, two, two million call hours on the open science grid. So this is very useful for us. You know, without uh, Pegasus and open science grid, I don't think we can finish the, this part of the work. Uh, there are also other workflow we are trying to uh, deploy to open science grid and also using uh, Pegasus. So one thing that myself is working on is to use uh, Monte Carlo radiative transfer to model the spectrum. So for this part, just the modeling itself is computationally expensive in, enough that we, we think we, we will need uh, Pegasus to help us. There are some other workflow you know, that can potentially use uh, Pegasus and Open Science Grid, including the imaging survey. I mentioned earlier that the image uh, reconstruction is not actually not unique. There are many, many solutions that's possible. So we are doing imaging survey to get you know, up to millions of images, and then we need to understand which image is correct. So those kind of work can also go into a Pegasus workflow. Uh, and, and at the end, we can also do feature extraction. But you know, all of this actually work in progress. Um, and right now we have some uh, your major results that's upcoming. So I would just say, uh, stay tuned. Uh, in terms of feedback, I guess the first thing is thank you everyone for uh, you know, putting together such a great tool. Uh, for our workflow, I guess one thing we really want is the IROS uh, integration uh, in, in Pegasus. You know, right now we are using the web that uh, interface of the cyber data store, but it's actually not as high performance as IROS. So it would be great if we can just use IROS directly. Uh, another thing is, uh, you know, we actually overload the, the SideWorks data server. So we need to put in, you know, just random delay in our uh, data pooling uh, step. So it will be good to have a global limit on a particular step in the task. You know, maybe that's already uh, available, but we just didn't, uh, we just don't know about that. Uh, another thing we really want to do is to have multiple containers that, that's, that can uh, interact on a single uh, worker log. So this will map more closely to the microservice uh, idea in the cloud computing world. So right now we, we need to put in put all the software in a big container and we actually try to get uh, away of that. So that will you know, it would be nice if there is a way to, to do that in packages. Uh, so that's all I have. Uh, thanks for your attention. Mm -hmm.